Good morning, uh, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to uh, the second session of the Democratizing Work Global Seminar Series. My name is Pavlina Cherneva, and I direct the Open Society University Network's Economic Democracy Initiative, which is a co-sponsor of this event. Uh, today's topic is assessing global progress towards a job guarantee. The Democratizing Work Global Seminars aim to advance the principles of the Democratizing Work Manifesto, which garnered global attention during the pandemic. And the job guarantee proposal is a concrete path to securing the second pillar of the manifesto, and that is namely to decommodify work. So it's my pleasure to uh, welcome uh, this uh, panel of distinguished guests. We have with us experts and policymakers who are developing or already managing large-scale national employment policies that are informed um, by the principles of the job guarantee. So the aim today for us is to uh, talk about the goals of the proposal and to learn about different strategies for achieving those. So let me quickly introduce um, list. We will kick off uh, with uh, Olivia de Scuta, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. And he will frame the conversation for us today as he is working on a UN report on the job guarantee to uh, be issued later this year. Uh, then we will proceed to uh, Kate Phillip, uh, who is the program lead on the Presidential Employment Stimulus in South Africa. Uh, Kate has researched, researched and evaluated various uh, job guarantee-like programs uh, while she was at the ILO. And she now heads the Presidential Employment Stimulus Program in South Africa uh, and will share the approach and the design of the program. Uh, we then welcome uh, Diego Guevara, uh, who is uh, General Vice Minister for Finance in Colombia. Uh, one of Diego's responsibilities uh, is to facilitate the Presidential National Investment Plan to be submitted before Parliament in Colombia um, in May, I believe. And he will present the strategy which is being formulated in Colombia uh, based on multiple pilots from different ministries. Uh, we are also uh, delighted to welcome uh, Daniel uh, Rojas Medellin, uh, who is president of the Special Assets Agency in Colombia, which uh, manages seized assets from narco trafficking. And he and his staff are going to share some ideas for using the job guarantee um, in the agency's work. So thank you very much for joining us once again. And without further ado, I give the floor to Olivier. Well, many thanks, Pavlina, and very warm welcome uh, to the colleagues uh, who are joining us for this uh, seminar in the uh, Economic uh, Democracy Initiative. Um, as you mentioned, Pavlina, um, I've been appointed uh, Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights to provide recommendations to governments as to what could be done to combat extreme poverty and to do so using the tool of human rights. And in the world of human rights, Although the right to work is listed amongst uh, the human rights that people should enjoy, that right to work is really understood by governments and by human rights uh, experts as meaning simply that governments should do what they can in order to um, stimulate uh, uh, employment creation. They should lead an active policy um, designed to promote full, productive, and freely chosen employment. These are the terms of the ILO Employment Policy Convention of 1964. And the right to work, uh, therefore, imposes not a, a duty of result, not a duty to provide a job, but an obligation of means, a duty to do whatever can be done to, to stimulate um, the growth of employment. SDG number eight, refers uh, also to uh, full and productive employment and decent work for all women and men in that same spirit. There is no um, binding obligation on governments to provide work to people who are able and willing to work um, as, as a way to protect that, that human right. And I hope the report I will be presenting in June um, of this year, which is now being finalized, 
will uh, trigger a debate within the human rights community, within the, um, uh, the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly of the UN concerning this idea of uh, a job guarantee. Um, of course, as we all know, uh, the idea is not without precedence. Um, the Work Progress uh, Administration, as part of the New Deal that, launch, that was launched by President Roosevelt in um, 1932, was a major part of um, the reforms of the New Deal. And uh, since many years, public work programs have been developed in response to mass unemployment, especially in times of crisis. Often, these were programs that were labor-intensive, heavy infrastructure works for road maintenance, for the digging of wells, uh, for example. But increasingly, we see public work programs that are focusing on education, on care, on community work. And for example, uh, quite a few governments have been using this tool in response to the um, crisis uh, which resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic over the past uh, two or three years. Examples of the most studied public works programs that have been uh, um, perhaps the most uh, spectacular are the Productive Safety Net program in Ethiopia, the Expanded Public Works program in South Africa, and now the South African Presidential Stimulus that uh, Kate Phillip will discuss later today, um, the National Rural Employment Guarantee Act launched in 2005 in India, and I'm delighted to see that Jean Drez, who has been behind this program, is joining this discussion. And in Argentina, we have the uh, Jefes y Jefas, um, the Horar program launched in 2002 in Argentina in response to the um, crisis that the country faced at that time. Now, the job guarantee in the in the meaning, um, um, I will be studying it um, and uh, providing recommendations to government as to how it could be designed, um, has four characteristics. First, it is not just a short-term or temporary response to a crisis. It is a permanent feature of um, labor market policy, uh, providing um, macroeconomic benefits by operating in a counter-cyclical fashion, and I will return to this point. Secondly, it is voluntary. In other terms, it's not a duty to work. It is not uh, a condition for benefiting from some forms of social protection. It is uh, something that individuals may freely choose to enter uh, or not. Uh, thirdly, uh, the job guarantee should provide decent work, um, work that provides fair wages, uh, that guarantees um, safe and healthy working conditions, that includes social benefits, that provides prospects for personal development and social integration, inter alia through training, uh, work that allows for workers' participation and work that uh, benefits from uh, the, the guarantee of equal opportunities, in other terms, open to all without discrimination. Fourth and finally, um, the job guarantee um, is a, 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 an active um, labor market policy that is meant to also fulfill the needs of the community, um, providing um, work, services, goods, that are undersupplied by the market, uh, but respond to societal needs. And again, this is a point I will return to. So these are the four characteristics I see as central to the job guarantee, as at least I understand it. And uh, thus understood, the job guarantee is premised on two assumptions. First, um, each individual is employable, even though he or she may not be able to find work um, in the labor market as it is shaped, um, uh, one um, is presumed to be able to um, uh, train that person or employ that person using his or her qualifications as best as possible. And, and the second assumption is that there is enough work for all. There are many unmet societal needs uh, for, for example, the decarbonization of the economy, uh, the provision of care to older persons, although the employment opportunities may be scarce and insufficient. So thus understood, I believe that the job guarantee has a number of benefits it can provide. And to a large extent, I know I'm here preaching the converted, but still I would like to list very briefly, I know that 
time is short, but eight benefits that I believe could structure the future discussions around the desirability or, uh, of introducing a job guarantee. Now, the first, um, the first benefit is, of course, to provide um, income security and to, and to combat poverty. Um, in 2022, the global unemployment rate is about 5.7%. 203 million people uh, are job seekers worldwide, but that is vastly underestimating the problem of structural mass unemployment. Um, in fact, those figures do not include those discouraged from searching work, um, called the inactives, and um, it does not include many who are in involuntary part-time work um, or work in very precarious uh, conditions um, um, in non-standard types of work in particular. In addition, in the years 2019-2035, it is anticipated that about 470 million additional people will be seeking work in developing countries, so we need to provide uh, opportunities for all those people. That's the first uh, major reason why the job guarantee is uh, a policy option that is worth uh, not just exploring, but, but implementing. The, the second um, benefit is to improve wages and working conditions across the whole economy by strengthening the bargaining position of workers who will have a sort of guaranteed fallback option um, ensuring that they will not be forced to accept substandard types of work. And um, this will also put a pressure on the informal sector to formalize uh, jobs. The third benefit is that uh, the job guarantee may contribute to building skills and training the participants so that their employment prospects are improved once they uh, graduate out of the program. The fourth benefit is that um, the job guarantee may favor the inclusion of certain groups which face particular difficulties in entering the, uh, the, the employment market, inter alia because of discrimination, people with disabilities, uh, women, so ethnic minorities in a number of countries face obstacles in having access to jobs, long-term unemployed people against whom employers routinely discriminate. And I note that, for example, um, some programs, uh, such as the National Rural Employment Guarantee um, Act in, in India, have specific provisions for women, quotas for women, childcare services on the site of employment to encourage them to apply for these, for these jobs in order to provide them, in many cases, for the first opportunity to make um, a living outside um, the, the home. Um, we also have public work programs that can break down gender stereotypes, for example, by training women into traditionally male jobs, such as in the construction sector, or indeed um, drawing more men into the care sector. So I think that is a, a fourth potential benefit of the job guarantee um, idea. It is to break down these barriers that many groups still face in having access to decent uh, employment. Um, the um, the fifth uh, benefit from uh, the job guarantee idea is that um, it can provide an automatic stabilizer to the economy, preventing massive unemployment in times of crisis, and thus operating counter-cyclically. Um, in fact, that was the primary motivation um, of the Works Progress Administration established under the New Deal. And, and it is uh, one way to avoid um, uh, the slowdown of the economy turning into a recession by, by stimulating demand, demand and maintaining the purchasing power of low-income households. Um, sixth, the job guarantee idea um, can deliver goods and services to the community that would otherwise be undersupplied, either because these goods and services are public goods um, that private actors have no incentive to provide. For example, for the cleaning up of green areas in the cities or the recycling of waste, or because the beneficiaries of such services have a limited ability to pay and thus uh, the employment that should be created to satisfy those needs um, will, never be, will never be financed by um, uh, the private sector. 
Um, that is the case, for example, for uh, care to older persons or early childhood education and care. Um, and finally, in a number of countries where the um, you know, public works programs or uh, job guarantee equivalent programs have been implemented, um, local communities were able to decide which priorities they should set um, to employ people on public projects. Um, that is, for example, what, what uh, happens at Panchayat level in, in India. And that can be very empowering for communities. It can promote uh, local democracy and um, civic participation, creating a sense of, of ownership um, and ensuring that the local priorities um, will, be, will be met although it is not uh, by far the case of all public work programs, um, many have this, um, uh, this uh, additional benefits uh, that they can contribute. So these are a number of reasons why um, I believe the idea of the job guarantee is one that uh, should be um, widely debated. And of course, there is no one size fits all and each country will have to design its own uh, program based on local conditions and institutional um, uh, specificities. Um, but today is really a time where we, we, we need uh, more imagination and, and it is imaginative proposals such as this one that we most lack in times of crisis. So many thanks, uh, Pavlina, for, for leading the global effort in uh, promoting this idea. And I, I very much look forward to participating in this, um, in this campaign and, and working with uh, the other participants in this seminar. Many thanks. Well, um, I would like to ask if um, maybe we switch the order of the presentations and it looks like Diego has been called um, yeah, <laughs> by the minister. And yeah, so I apologize. In advance, Pavlina, I have an appointment with just the minister that I just knew before. So I, I will be super short. I apologize in advance just to present something. So thank you very much, Pavlina, for the invitation. And thank you, everyone here. Uh, basically, uh, uh, it is these job guarantee programs in, in, in Colombia, uh, when we were discussing in the political campaign, we were part of the of the campaign for of, of Gustavo Petro for for president, and now Petro is the president. Let's let's say that is the first progressist uh, president in the history of Colombia. And when we were planning the the government plan before with with Daniel, who is also here with with us, we start to discuss why we cannot try to introduce the idea of job guarantee programs. And also, Daniel has already studied some post ideas and some job guarantee ideas. So we had a first approach in, in, in the campaign, and then we have a short visit of Paulina here in November, where we visit uh, some agencies. Uh, and I wanted to, to, to present, let me share my screen for short, short, uh, uh, short presentation with some data to, uh, about, about, about Colombia. Um, uh, to, to let you know why uh, a different approach to the unemployment is needed in, in the country. Uh, I don't know if you are seeing the screen. Yeah, I think that, yeah. So I think that, I mean, I think that uh, it, it's important to talk about job warranty in the periphery uh, because basically in the periphery, I don't want to go in detail. I think that already, uh, I think that, that already Oliver and Paulina have done a, an, an important introduction about job warranty. But I think that if you take a look of a peripheral country like Colombia, the unemployment rate usually is around 10%. I mean, in the, in the crisis of 2001, the unemployment rate was 15%. Even in the, during the pandemic, the unemployment rate rise up to 20%. And still now the unemployment rate in the country is 11%. Uh, so basically when you have this a scenario, uh, you need to think in different alternatives because basically the main programs in Colombia uh, to fight against poverty has been focused on cash transfers, and a huge part of the uh, of the of the social policy in Latin America it doesn't matter if it was the left or the right, uh, basically was cash transfer and. And in the first decade of the 2000s, when the left governments, uh, when in the first wave of the left governments in the region, basically also were uh, cash transfer, and there was no, and, and there were not uh, a, a strong uh, employed program. So basically, now in the second wave of 
uh, of progressive governments now Colombia is part of this second wave uh, we want to we want to focus in in some specific pilot programs Let, let's say that it is this is important and and where um and what, what we, we were discussing with Pavlina in November we, we see the culture the culture minister where they want to do some pilots program also in the asset agency with Daniel but this is the from the macroeconomic point of view when you have 10% of employment and your GDP is growing at 8%, something is wrong. You're having a really good growth of the GDP. However, still the unemployment is around 10%. You need something else than growth. And basically this is where the a specific program. If, if, if we take a look to some sp specific data, for example, for women, the unemployment is still in this in the last year was 12% and the youth unemployment rate was 17%. Uh, and basically, I think that we need to start to think these job warranty programs for some specific population as women and youth. And, and we'll discuss later with Simone and Daniel some specific uh, programs that we are having here in in, Col in in Colombia that we start to push. We we have been just five months in the in the government. I used to be a scholar as Pavlina. I have like an associate professor position in the university. But with the new government, I had the chance to come here as deputy finance minister to work with Jose Antonio Campo. And this is part of the programs that we want to to push in different agencies, taking into account this uh, employment uh, data. So basically, in the National Development Plan or in the National Investment Plan, Colombia, Potencia Mundial de la Vida, or Colombia, Power of Life, there is a specific access about human security and social justice, and also a specific policy for productive inclusion with decent work. And I think that from this point of view, uh, we want to recognize the decent work in the popular economy to have a different approach to, to, to informality. And at the same time, the, the employment uh, creation, it's highly important uh, for this for this for for this for this government and the job warranty and, and if you take a look in, in in the spanish program is the trabajo garantizado is is there is there and we tried and we are trying to push in the national development plan uh, and a specific article uh, that allows to the different entities and agencies to start to push some specific programs so basically those are the two articles basically the next the next in the next two months we are going to start to discuss in the colombian parliament the national development plan and we are proposing two specific articles in the national development plan which allows to implement the job warranty as a finance minister for example uh, we cannot implement a specific job warranty programs but in the investment plan through these specific articles we can allow that some specific agencies as as the agency where Daniel Wars, Lasai, or other specific minister can create programs. So those are the two specific articles that are going to turn in law of the Republic. So basically those are the creation of support programs for formal employment. Uh, and basically it's through the Minister of Labor, we want to create, or in other case, to have some level of flexibility, the extension of, or termination of support programs for formal employment in public entities and trying to have based on labor, economic and social variables indicators. As it's a pilot program, we need to start to calibrate uh, this, this, first, uh, this first program. Uh, of course, when you think in, in, in the job warranty scheme, you think in a universal program, uh, because also you have behind a different approach for financing these programs. But a first step before to start to uh, to go to a big approach, what we are trying to, to have here is to push the idea that it's better to offer jobs than cash transfer. I think that this is a first dispute in the periphery. Because for many policymakers, uh, in the traditional in, in in the traditional approach, what they have been supporting during two decades has been cash transfers. Maybe some specific condition. If you have kids, if the kids go to schools, okay. If, the, uh, if you if you take your kids to with good health uh, to the hospital, it's gonna be okay. But basically, it's cash transfer that is not conditionated for, uh, with labor. Uh, we want to transfer this cash transfer uh, for uh, at the beginning. Try to create some kind of conditionality with labor. Uh, otherwise, it's just cash transfer with some basic conditions. So basically. Uh, this is like a general article, and now the first specific program that we are going to create is called Jóvenes en Paz or Youth for Peace. Uh, not basically, 
uh, Colombia, after more than 40 years of conflict, uh, still we signed a peace agreement, still the president is trying to work in a peace process in the rural area, rural areas of Colombia. And we want to create a, a program for Jones between 14 and 28 years old, where they can work in the territory uh, and at the same time, they can have some uh, financial support for some specific works in art, culture, and, in, and citizenship training. I think that this specific program is a first pilot that, that from the, uh, and a specific idea from the, from the, from the president. Here was some picture when Paulina uh, came here. I think that was important, this first push. We have a meeting with the culture minister, also with Danielle, in the in the special agency and Simon, that is his main advisor, and and there are another program. Maybe I will give the word to to Daniel in, in, and, and Simon in a while. There are, for example, some programs in the in the in, in the for that they want to start to dignify in terms of culture, in terms the in terms of cultural initiative. Uh, they have a lot in in 2022, but what they told me that they have started to do in the Ministry of culture basically is to start to have a program to dignify the work and the living condition of artists that basically is a job guarantee program for artists in the regions uh, because basically um, most of the artists were in the informal labor market so basically with a job guarantee scheme uh, of a minimum wage for many artists i think that the, the culture minister have started to do a first pilot in some regions of of colombia so basically now just, just to summarize, we have the Hovenes and Past program, that is the program of the president for, for Joe's people uh, who were who were part of the war and now they are again uh, part of the civilian life. So we need to offer jobs for them uh, in, in a specific in, in a specific areas of art, culture, and citizenship, even in care. There is a program we were taking a look for some programs that the health minister wants to offer in terms of family care. Uh, but still, they don't have a specific uh, design uh, to promote, but they want to also toward that. So those are the two programs. And maybe Simon and Daniel can talk a bit about oh, and the other. Maybe they can talk a bit about what is I. This is kind of a, a special agency that just exists maybe in Colombia uh, because of the conflict, because of the narco traffic. So when the government took a lot of the goods and the and the properties from the from the narcos from from the drug traffickers, uh, the government started to do different things. So no, I I, I will give the floor to Simon to explain a bit more what is the SAI and what you are doing with with Daniel there. To rush. Um... Yeah, I will be. Yeah, yeah, I will be. Sorry, in, in, in advance, this this is a bit crazy, life, but but no, yes. go go ahead if you want to present this a bit, Thanks. Simon. Hi, do you do you guys hear us? Uh, yeah. Yes, if Diego, if you can uh, just stop your presentation, stop uh, screen sharing. Actually, if if you could leave his presentation with the, okay. with this slide, it would be perfect. Okay. Thank you. Buen día para todos, para todas. Good morning to all. Bueno, soy Daniel Rojas, presidente de la Sociedad de Activos Especiales. My name is Daniel Rojas and I'm the president of the Special Asset Society. Y también seré muy breve en este um, espacio para presentar eh, un poco cómo oh, la Sociedad de Activos Especiales se articula a este esfuerzo de gobierno de generar las condiciones para la creación de un programa de trabajo garantizado en el en el país. I'll do my best to be brief uh, in this presentation, but I'll try to explain how the Special Asset Society uh, is involved with and aims to be the hub and the space to create pilots towards the job guarantee by the Colombian government. Primero explicar que eh, la sociedad de activos especiales Eh, es la entidad encargada de administrar aquellos activos que alguna vez pertenecieron a las economías ilegales, principalmente del narcotráfico. Y eh, esa administración no solamente mmm, conlleva a poner estos activos en comercialización, sino que a, también ponerlos al servicio de nuevas formas, de nuevas economías. Um, so, in essence, I'll try to explain briefly what SAI is. 
where the state company that is in charge of administering assets sees to illicit economies, mainly mafia, narco, drug dealing, uh, but not exclusively that origin. Uh, traditionally, what was done before was a logic of monetization and commercialization of the assets, goods uh, that were administered by the company. But now our aim is to put these goods and these assets um, as a space towards building new economies and a productive transformation of the country. Y como lo decía Diego, eh, el propósito de este gobierno es que cuando hablamos de nuevas economías, nos pensemos en primero aumentar o mejor, digamos, aprovechar la capacidad productiva del país para aumentar esa productividad y segundo, eh, poner el Estado al servicio de la generación de empleo de calidad. Um, so, as Diego was trying to explain, this government has two central aims. One is basically um, creating a series of policies that aim to improve productivity in the country and uh, aim to foster productive development. Uh, and uh, second of all, ¿cuál es el segundo punto? Eh, generar empleo de calidad para los sectores más excluidos del país. And for there to be a state policy of uh, decent work generation for those who are in the most vulnerable conditions in the country. Y es por eso que eh, hemos mm, nos hemos constituido como un laboratorio de las políticas que deben servir de transición de la antigua modelo económico al nuevo modelo económico. And that's precisely the reason why SAI aims to be the laboratory, the hub of this productive transformation from the old economies towards this new economic model. En este caso específico, servir de laboratorio de lo que podría ser un programa de trabajo garantizado en Colombia y es lo que quiero explicar a continuación. In this specific case, is how SAI can be the hub and the laboratory for a job guarantee program towards job guarantee program in Colombia. And that's what I will try to explain. El viejo modelo económico tiene como mecanismo estabilizador un buffer de desempleo que eh, arroja resultados tan preocupantes como los que acaba de mostrar Diego. Our old economic model has paradoxically an unemployment buffer uh, that uh, then leads to those worrying statistics and results that the vice minister was explaining before. El nuevo modelo implica cambiar ese buffer de desempleo por un buffer de empleo que sea también un mecanismo de estabilizador macroeconomic. This new economic model aims to work towards not an unemployment buffer as before, but an employment buffer that aims to serve as a macroeconomic stabilizing mechanism. Pero las realidades de nuestro país, un país periférico, eh, implican que eh, dependencia frente a otras variables macroeconómicas. Por lo tanto, el nuevo modelo económico tiene que apropiarlas para, mm, a, la, a la par que se genera un programa de empleo garantizado, también generar el aumento de la productividad en sectores específicos. But uh, the conditions of a peripheral country like Colombia generate a dependency uh, towards a series of international variables. And within the country, what that means is that a job guarantee program needs to be not only towards a logic of employment generation, but towards a logic of improving productivity in very specific sectors of the economy. Por eso, este laboratorio se plantea en dos vías. La primera, que es la de generar unos proyectos productivos que puedan absorber mano de obra no calificada con muy baja calificación. So the, this, the, there's two logics to this for SAI. So the first is that the company is able to use its assets to be the hub and to be the space where productive projects are generated that are able to absorb unskilled labor in those projects. Haciendo uso de los activos que administramos y que fueron incautados a la mafia. 
uh, finding use for those assets that we sequestered and that currently administered that were seized from the mafia. Este sería nuestro pequeño buffer de empleo. This is our little employment buffer. Mm. Y una segunda etapa de este, de este, no, mejor, primero eh, expliquemos. Consisten en, primero, usar los predios urbanos que administramos para generar proyectos de autoconstrucción de vivienda. So the first, we'll try to explain these uh, three main approaches and three main projects we have. So the first is uh, this popular approach towards self-construction and self-improvement of housing, making use of those urban plots of land that we currently hold and administer within the Colombian cities. Usar los predios rurales que administramos para ponerlos al servicio de comunidades campesinas para la producción agroalimentaria. Then us using those seeds, uh, rural plots of land, uh, in a country with such a high inequality of land ownership and land production, um, for uh, peasant communities, for campesino cooperatives, and for improving productivity in the rural sector and the agroalimentarian production. Y utilizar los activos de capital que nosotros administramos, particularmente bienes muebles, para la generación de valor agregado en estos programas productivos. In that very same logic, using those capital assets we currently have, mainly uh, machinery and those that are not land itself, but rather, or mainly machinery, uh, for them to be used in order to improve productivity and technify production in our projects. Esto implica que los beneficiarios de estos programas, mano de obra, que son particularmente mano de obra no calificada, tengan a la, eh, en, de, durante, la, durante la duración del proyecto, durante eh, su, su permanencia en el programa, un, un continuo proceso de formación y de cualificación para que lleguen a ser lo que hemos denominado depositarios populares, administradores de sus propios proyectos productivos. So in that very same logic, the aim is that whilst the project is going on and whilst the program is uh, well, taking place, there's a logic of job training and job formation uh, of skills and of well, different abilities that people are able to learn uh, in these projects so that when they graduate, the logic would migrate, as uh, Olivier was explaining before, they graduate from the program, but not only towards the regular labor market, but rather towards a logic of having the people administer their very own assets that they previously worked on in a model that we've denominated depositarios populares in Spanish, would, would roughly translate in English to people's administrators, which is not only job training, but training for them to administer and to run the companies themselves. Implica además que logremos alianzas con agencias del Estado que giran eh, transferencias monetarias para convertirlas en los salarios de los beneficiarios del programa. So what this implies as well is as Diego was explaining, the Colombian pseudo eh, welfare state, which is traditionally based upon cash transfers, we are able to ally ourselves with these agencies that are in charge of the transfers so that they, in our projects, the people that are beneficiaries for, from this usual cash transfer, be them conditioned or non-conditioned, uh, we are able to transform those transfers into a logic of a wage, of a salary in our productive projects. Pero para que el mecanismo de estabilización funcione, necesitamos que los beneficiarios hagan un tránsito hacia el mercado laboral. So in order for the, the uh, stabilization mechanism to work, what we obviously need, as Olivia was explaining, is a transit to uh, the regular labor market. Y en ese sentido, queremos usar las empresas que administramos y que también alguna vez pertenecieron a la mafia para, dentro de nuestro laboratorio, poder simular, no sé si es la palabra, ese tránsito del que hablamos. So, uh, this is a bit uh, complicated to explain, but basically is that logically uh, what we think when we the state seizes assets, it seizes physical assets. But through the logic of money laundering in the country, 
uh, companies that were used by the mafia to launder their money are seized by the state and are administered by us. In that very same logic, we aim to use those companies as sort of a space that can emulate that transition to the regular labor market and that the companies themselves are able to absorb uh, in their, obviously not in the universal macroeconomic sense, but in their specific sense, they're able to absorb uh, those very same jobs. Este tránsito supone, en el agregado, el tránsito eh, propio que genera el ciclo económico. Suponemos que la política de industrialización, que también está enmarcada en nuestro plan de desarrollo, eh, debe, lógicamente, eh, generar las condiciones para que nuevas compañías, nuevas empresas, absorban una mano de obra que ya no es de baja calificación porque eh, en el programa se ha cualificado y permita que el programa tenga el carácter contracíclico. So, uh, in order for a job guarantee program to have a counter-cyclical effect and to have an, an effect in the, in the economy, what needs to happen is that through the program, and specifically in our pilots, people are formed, they are... Well, to, transform from unskilled labor to skilled labor with specific abilities and skills. But at the same time, as Diego was explaining, our national development program also includes an industrialization policy in the specific sectors that, and those sectors are those which need support in order to absorb the skilled labor that the program produces. If this uh, sort of bandwagon is not fulfilled, then what would, we would be generating is skilled labor that cannot be employed because the economic cycle is not able to absorb it. And that's why the program needs to be sort of articulated with an industrialization policy uh, with a, in the case of Colombia, at least, and the countries in what we would call the global south, uh, with a sectorial uh, characteristic of uh, promoting industrialization. Esto no solo dotaría a los trabajadores de mayor cualificación, sino de mejores condiciones para la negociación de sus salarios. Por lo tanto, ayudaría a mejorar las condiciones de los trabajadores. This would not only obviously improve the uh, conditions of each and every worker, but rather be, have an effect of improving the bargaining position of workers in the economy, uh, which would then to generate an effect of improving conditions across The labor market. Nos pensamos un laboratorio que se desarrolle en el término de un año para que, dados los resultados, podamos emular la eh, experiencia a nivel ma macroeconómico o a nivel eh, agregado eh, para proponerle al gobierno nacional extenderlo como política macroeconómica. So SAI, the Special Asset Society, as a laboratory, aims to develop these programs so that in the course of a year, we're able to demonstrate results, concrete um, experiences that can then be used uh, in order to promote a larger macroeconomically relevant uh, policy of a job guarantee to propose it to the state, proving its effectiveness and proving its logic through the use of the assets. Uh, administered by the company. Eso sería todo. Muchas gracias por su atención. Uh, that would be all. Thank you so much. And we're here open for questions. Uh, Paulina, I'm afraid you've got your microphone. Thank you. Thank you very much for your presentation and for outlining your, your thinking and your strategy and uh, uh, your kind of vision of uh, the macroeconomic uh, framework within which these programs are launched, but also um, the very much specific ways in which uh, projects can be created with the principles of democratizing work, with the principles of self-government, um, uh, 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 self um administration. It was very, very interesting to hear. And so now we will move on to the last presentation, which is uh, by Kate Phillip, uh, where she will share how indeed a program uh, has been implemented and has been running for some time. Um, Kate, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. 
Um, just getting this up. Uh, sorry. There we go. So thanks so much. And that was fascinating to hear. Um, I'm going to be talking about uh, the South African context and in particular the presidential employment stimulus. Our slogan is building a society that works. And we talk about reimagining public employment programs. Um, the context of this program, South Africa has a long history. Uh, sorry, I don't know what happened there. South Africa has a long history with public employment programs. We also have a very severe crisis of unemployment. Um, you know, when I see your figures of 10% unemployment, frankly, we're envious. <laughs> we have 35% unemployment. We have 45% if you include discouraged work seekers and 55% uh, youth unemployment. And this was a crisis before COVID, but COVID exacerbated the crisis. And a point that I want to make in terms of the context of the job guarantee is that, um, you know, the higher your rate of unemployment, the higher the level of fiscal anxiety at initiating a job guarantee. So at one level, if your unemployment is at 5%, then I would argue a job guarantee program is a no-brainer and not terribly difficult to win in policy terms. But the, high, the more you need it, the harder the fiscal case um, becomes. So that's part of our context. These are the outcomes of the last two years. Um, this program was announced as part of the economic recovery strategy. Um, we have delivered over a million jobs and livelihood opportunities in that period. It hasn't all been plain sailing. Um, we were working within what was, has often been described as hostile timeframes, often unrealistic expectations, to be honest. Um, but we have managed to deliver what is on the screen. And don't worry about the detail. Um, all of those acronyms are the names of different government departments. And I think the point that is being made here, or that um, this, this performance slide, which we have to present always as part of our performance reporting, um, what it illustrates is how we were able to mobilize across government to support um, uh, the design and implementation of employment programs with highly variable results. And one of the variations is on scale. If you look under jobs created, you'll see DBE, which is the Department of Basic Education, has delivered nearly 600,000 jobs in the two years. Compared to our Department of Employment and Labor, who one might think might do better, delivered 177. So the issue is that designing for scale is a really critical part of strategy. Um, to be fair, on the department, that's the budget they got. <laughs> um, I think another key feature about the program is that it had different components. So there's a public employment component, the jobs created. There's also a focus on livelihood supported. And in the context of COVID, there was support to job retention as well. Um, so a mixed, uh, a, a mixed portfolio, but we have felt that a portfolio approach really allowed us to experiment. We talk about becoming an innovation sandbox within the presidency that was able to support innovation in this space. And we think with some very interesting results, 83% of participants across the board have been youth, 63% female. Um, I think a key question for job guarantees is the issue of the interface with self-employment, with precarity and with the gig economy. And I'll talk to this with an example of um, how we approach this. So these are some examples of um, uh, some of the highlights, the 15 programs overall. Um, these are some of the highlights I'm going to speak to them. Some of those that I won't speak to include um, the ECD program. We had a production input voucher scheme um, for subsistence farmers uh, that reached over 140,000 subsistence farmers. It was done using a USSD platform, which meant that for the first time ever, the department now has a geospatially referenced database of subsistence farmers broken down into their production categories. And it's had the unintended consequence also of stimulating a market response to demand um, because subsistence farmers have been able to buy inputs at greater scale. So we've had um, a range of programs and I will, uh, I, I will speak to some of them. Um, 
but as you can see, there's 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 uh, there's a great deal of diversity within the portfolio. So our biggest program, um, which is also, as it happens, the the biggest youth employment program in South Africa's history, is the Basic Education Employment Initiative. And this program has placed young people as school assistants in schools. There have been two cohorts so far. The next cohort starts next week, which will take us to 850,000 young people who have had a quite substantive work experience in schools. And I think this program has a number of interesting features. Firstly, it really is a very high quality work experience because often there's almost a one-to-one -one mentorship relationship with a teacher. We, um, in our context, the private sector in South Africa often uh, says that um, one of the, the big obstacles to, to employing young people is that they lack work skills, that they are disruptive in the workplace. They don't want them in their workplaces because they lack work skills. And so we've put a lot of emphasis on the kinds of work skills that are, are learnt in the schools. And schools provide excellent work skills in the sense that there's time management, task management, communication skills. They're doing admin, they're doing IT. Um, we have two categories within the program. We have teachers assistants who need a minimum school leaving um, qualification um, and can work in the classrooms and graduates are prioritized in that program. And we have an unskilled component which focuses on maintenance, on food gardens, on security in the schools, on um, uh, those kinds of activities, including after school activities. We 72% of participants um, had never worked before. We've had a very high approval rating from teachers and principals. 94,6% of 60,000 teachers who were surveyed wanted the program to continue. This exceeded our expectations. And one of the reasons for this has been that unlike other public employment programs in South Africa, we are um, paying the national minimum wage, which really facilitated a partnership with labor and with the, with the trade unions. Um, so it's been a strong program with strong outcomes, but of particularly exciting is its spatial footprint. You know, every community in the society has schools. And so they provide a distributed network that we were able to tap into and create this image of distribution of youth jobs. The map on the left shows youth employment density by South African municipality without the program and on the right with the program. Apologies, the scales are different, they're being corrected, but I think the broad picture remains the same. So from, a, from in, in a country that has a huge level of spatial inequality because of a history of apartheid and history of exclusion uh, that had a very strong spatial dimension, um, the spatial equity dimension is a really important strength of the design of this program. I think one of the important things about this program is it can work anywhere in the world. Um, if, you know, every society has schools and schools can typically uh, take on board um, school assistants. So it's 10 to 20 school assistants in every school. It hasn't overwhelmed their management. Schools opt in, which is important, and schools decide on the task allocations. Um, they decide on the numbers that they're going to take. Uh, but they have been able to make excellent use of these young people in the schools um, with real, really strong impacts on the learning environment as well. So we've got uh, research coming off that's indicating um, that this is positively impacting um, on, on, uh, on the learning environment in schools, which is important social value. This program was able to go to a scale of 300,000 in just six weeks after the announcement of the launch of the stimulus. Um, so it is certainly one of our success stories. Um, so let me move now to a very different example and interesting that uh, our previous speakers was, were also talking about the creative sector. This is an example in which we varied the traditional public employment model. The schools program is very much a, 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 a traditional public employment model, if you like, but the state is the employer creating work that uh, that serves the common good, um, that contributes to public goods and services. But in the creative sector, we were aware that um, many in the sector who were very badly affected by COVID, so they were a target group, the majority in the sector were employed in small entities or they were self-employed, many were in non-profit organizations. Um, and so we, 
often doing precarious work and in the, 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 the gig economy. So the approach that we took was to create what we called a cultural sector employment stimulus, where we used entities in the sector to do large scale calls for proposals, again, the largest stimulus the sector had had, um, inviting uh, the sector itself to propose work that would create new creative work in order to create jobs for themselves and for others. Um, in the process, they created a huge range of outputs of cultural and social value, movies, plays, performances, and more. Um, what has been interesting about this is that many of those outputs were able to earn additional incomes. So movie and theater tickets, the sale of rights, um, uh, uh, you know, jazz concert tickets, um, uh, many different uh, mechanisms through which people were able to leverage the support um, to, 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 to get further income, which is highly um, uh, uh, positive. I think in the graphs, what you can see um, uh, very, you know, the, the high number that created jobs that the entity had not supported before, um, and then a proportion reactivating jobs that were terminated because of the pandemic and those able to retain jobs. And of course, many were in across all of those categories. Um, an unanticipated outcome was that 67% of respondents said that they were able to create some permanent jobs um, as a result of the support, uh, which I think is also a very interesting um, um, outcome in this particular case. We have had a long focus on public employment in, in the environmental sector and, and, and we built on that in this process. But I think one of the interesting things that we tried to focus on in this context was looking at new ways of of working in the sector. In particular, we focused on catchment management strategies. And we worked with a partner that was really very skilled in building um, networks of stakeholders because catchment management, you need to manage the whole catchment. And in the catchment, typically you have many different users and, and, and adjacent landowners from traditional authorities through sometimes to mines and factories, um, municipalities, rural areas, subsistence farmers, and bringing that diversity of stakeholders into a common strategy for catchment management is quite a feat. One of the things that has prevented that has been um, the difficulty of procuring partnerships. And so one of the things that we found is like with cultural sector, that setting up fund mechanisms where people can broker those partnerships as part of their proposal and then propose an, integ an integrated response allows um, for resourcing of those kinds of approaches in a way that circumvents some of the, the, the challenges of, 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 of procurement. For us, a key issue in this area is trying to use public employment as a base to build a payment for environmental services model that would see many of these jobs become permanent. These jobs create real economic value. The, the, the science around this is robust. Um, there are mechanisms through which uh, uh, the services, the ecological services that are provided can be paid for. Um, and so we're trying to use public employment to seed um, payment for environmental services mechanisms. We had a challenge to cities to innovate in this space. Um, one of the interesting areas has been a, a three-way partnership between um, an NGO in partnership with the Metro and the private sector doing um, uh, precinct management in, in the metro and providing employment uh, for um, uh, homeless people using uh, doing urban food gardens on public land. Um, and so a three-way partnership uh, in, in, in that regard is one of the outcomes from, from the city's program. I want to focus now on a, a strategy that is that we're particularly excited about, which is called the Social Employment Strategy. And we've set up a social employment fund. It's part of the social and solidarity economy, um, supporting work that serves the common good in communities. Um, as President Ramaphosa has said, um, there's no shortage of work to be done to make South Africa a better place. Um, and this particular uh, social employment strategy 
is trying to build community organization and support community level organization. So for us, the definition of social employment is publicly funded employment that is initiated and implemented by community driven processes. Um, so a slight variation on a, on, a, on, a, on a classic model. We have 26 strategic implementing partners. Some of those partners are in turn working with over 100 community-based organizations. So it's a, it's a cascading mechanism appointed from the non-state sector and contracted to employ 50,000 people. What was really interesting about this for us was that in the very first call for proposals, when the concept was pretty new and it was a new mechanism, we got proposals to the value of 7 billion rands, which translates into a potential 300,000 people. And so what this has already demonstrated is that this is a model that can really scale. We're now on our second round of calls for proposals. They're actually in adjudication right now. Um, and the take up has almost doubled. So really there's enormous ability to take a whole of society approach here and support bottom up forms of organization um, to create forms of work that respond to local community conditions. Um, we've put a lot of effort into the institutional arrangements for this. It has a central payment system. It has biometric enrollment and, um, and uh, um, sign in. What's, what's the right word? You know, <laughs> when you sign in and out each day, um, it has digital outputs reports uh, and it's reaching even the most remote corners of the country. Um, this is a part-time work model, and this model responds to the deeply structural nature of unemployment in South Africa. So rather than a short-term work opportunity, the idea here is two days a week of regular and predictable employment to provide scaffolding for engagement in livelihood, enterprise, education, and other activities. Um, this is just an example of the kinds of work that is that are encouraged. We have quoted Dr. Seuss here, or the things you can think of if only you try. And the intention is to encourage communities to imagine, to dream, to identify forms of work that could make a difference at the local level. And what has been exciting is that the forms of work that have emerged far exceed the expectations of all of these bubbles that include everything from computer clinics to food waste strategies, uh, music for people, um, counseling for victims of violence, public interest app design. These are all forms of work that can create public value that can contribute to work for the common good. These are just some examples of some of the kinds of things that are happening. So um, top left is a, is a community library that actually started with one young man and one book and he started reading to kids on the pavement in the context of COVID. It gathered momentum. It's now got partnerships with libraries. It's supported through the Social Employment Fund. It's actually moved to, to other communities. Um, there's ECD. I love this one on the right, um, which is a downtown music hub employing 200 musicians. Um, there's work with organic agriculture and linking young people to um, older uh, farmers for the transfer of indigenous agricultural knowledge. So there's a huge variety of forms of work that are taking place and that have been unlocked and unleashed um, by this particular program. Care is a big part of it. We do have a history of, of, of using public employment for care in South Africa. We've used this to augment that. I think all over the world, care is often an unresolved gender issue. Paying for it through public employment gives it social recognition and an economic value. Um, we see this as institutionalizing community-based care and translating what is often an individualized burden within a household into a shared and socialized form of work that gives both the carers and those receiving care access to wider networks of support. We also see this as part of putting the social back into social protection, which too often has become reduced simply to the issue of cash transfers. We see this as an instrument for institutionalizing community-driven forms of solidarity. We saw these emerging strongly in the context of the pandemic with things like community-run run food kitchens in the context of real hunger in the context of the pandemic. Often these were run by volunteers and many of those volunteers were themselves unemployed. All kinds of partnerships were developed with restaurants, farmers, 
public bodies and many others. But the fact of the matter is that this vital form of solidarity can become hard to sustain on a purely volunteer basis. And we see social employment as an instrument for sustaining solidarity at the community level. We also see it as an instrument for rebuilding the commons. We would argue that additional social instruments and institutions are needed to build and optimize the use of common resources, the sense of common ownership in communities, to build civic capital, strength, strengthen social ties and social co cooperation. Building organization is critical in building resilience uh, uh, in communities and local solutions to local problems. But building organization requires resourcing. And we see this as a mechanism um, for resourcing, uh, building these forms of organization. And then finally on this, um, we, we, the wider agenda here is that we see a real need to, we see this as an instrument for unlocking the social value of labor. Because even where labor has no market value, it has and can create social value. And this is something that the job guarantee agenda is very much um, framed around. Um, but what we need are instruments, social instruments that are able to unlock that value. Because at the moment, uh, you know, the value of labor is, is, is largely judged to be a market value. Uh, labor has been thoroughly commodified in many of our societies. How do we create instruments that can unlock um, the social value of labor and in the process uh, mitigate and limit uh, market primacy um, in, 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 in labor markets as part of uh, what we would see as the social construction of markets. And then finally, PEPs and the just transition. We're surprised that this isn't a bigger part of the just transition conversation. It's quite clear, certainly in our context, that even in best case scenarios, moving from dependence on coal um, to renewables is unlikely to be a seamless process. Um, and if it's not a seamless process, there's going to be resistance. And right now in South Africa, there is resistance because the transition involves job loss. Um, yes, green jobs, plenty of scope for that, but any and all decent jobs in the right place at the right time are part of a just transition. And we think that this needs to be elevated in the discourse. So I'll end just with some reflections on lessons. Um, and uh, sorry, I jumped the gun there. Um, and again, <laughs> so some of the challenges and lessons. Um, we, we like the portfolio approach. Um, it has delivered many different programs. We don't have one common model. We have models that can respond contextually in different ways. And this has enabled experimentation um, and diversity in the response. We've had a real strong focus on building the institutional architecture for scale uh, so that we can scale up and hopefully one day scale down um, counter cyclically. Um, but achieving scale has been a challenge in the South African context. In terms of the design of these programs, some of the battles that we have had with our national treasury, amicable battles, but battles nevertheless, have been around cost structures of these programs. And we argue that program management is absolutely critical. So many development programs fail because of poor management. So we need to resource management as if it matters. And yet there's been huge pushback on that. Literally, program management fees pushed down to two and a half percent. And we don't think that um, it's easy to manage a program well um, on that ratio. Yes, it's important to push for labor intensity, but at the same time, uh, don't do that at the expense of quality because few programs need no tools or materials for work to be performed. And so pushing for ever greater levels of labor intensity can actually sabotage the quality of outcomes. Um, the quality of outcomes requires a skills mix on site. In South Africa, there's been a tendency to emphasize only unskilled work as part of public employment, and we think that's, uh, that's actually not correct. Um, that it's important, particularly when you have unemployment across all skills bands, um, let's bring that in onto site, again, for the quality of outcomes. Um, we've seen antipathy to intermediaries and a push to cut out the middle person or middle agencies. But actually what we've seen in practice is that, um, yes, of course, intermediaries can be awful and intermediaries can cream off funding and not do a good job. 
But there are also intermediaries that do a really effective job at intermediating between the very rigorous requirements of compliance from the state and often informal grassroots organizations. We've seen huge opportunities for digital transversal payment systems, digital identity. We're working hard on those. In fact, some of the most interesting things happening in the space are happening in the public employment space. Um, we think work experience is undervalued relative to formal training. We've invested hugely in skills as a country. Um, it doesn't always lead to jobs. And actually we think the quality of the work experience um, and needs just as much attention. And I've spoken about a few fund mechanisms that we've used, and we found those very useful for enabling innovation and partnership. In terms of policy and research issues, yes, the interface with cash transfers, these have come up. Our argument is that poverty is multidimensional and solutions are two. We think it's not helpful for these to be presented as binary choices. Um, we think these are thoroughly complementary interventions. Um, we want to see more work on this issue of unlocking the social value of labor and shaping markets, labor markets in different ways, and what the implications are of providing people with alternatives to desperation in labor markets. You know, a key part of the added value of public employment programs is the impact of participation in work. It's not all about the incomes. Um, and yet the impact of participation in work is poorly researched and seldom evaluated. There are the psychosocial impacts, inclusion and social cohesion effects, the solidarity effects, social and economic functioning, productivity, all of these things. The link to pathways into employment, entrepreneurship and livelihoods is crucial. Um, we are always under pressure for participants to transition. With structural unemployment at our scale, that's often really hard. And so that's a difficult and complicated debate in our context. Uh, we do think we have a very strong case for a job guarantee that recognizes that the economy is not going to create employment at the scale uh, required for quite some time. And that the rationale for a jobs guarantee is very strong. But the political economy is one in which the expectation is one in which public employment programs enable transitions. And then finally, the issue of the stimulus effects in local economies, lots of room for more work there. I'll stop there. Uh, back uh, to you, Chair. Uh, so much food for thought. I think something that comes out very strongly from your presentation is that uh, the job guarantee, the public employment approach, it may well be a forgotten employment relief approach, but it is far more than that. It is really a support infrastructure. And then the portfolio approach that you outline um, shows us the many ways in which it provides support and stability, not only in this macroeconomic sense, but really stability for community, uh, support infrastructure for re addressing legacy inequities, um, uh, undervalued work, um, and other social and economic issues. So thank you very, very much for that. Um, we have uh, only 15 minutes left um, for Q&A. And so I would like to, well, first I want to ask a clarification question, Kate. Does the program, is the program open-ended uh, or does it have a uh, an expiration date that needs to be then reauthorized? <laughs> That's such a hard question <laughs> because the answer isn't, isn't, isn't the one I'd like to give. The program was initiated as a crisis response in COVID. Initially, we were given five months to implement, um, and many felt that we were set up for failure. But we achieved quite significant success in those five months, so we were given a second iteration. We were then given a third iteration, which is where we are now. We have funding secured to March 24, but in the last medium-term budget policy statement, we were not included beyond that. And we are right now engaged in a very intensive policy debate um, over whether or not the program will extend beyond March 24. So I wish I could give you a different answer, but that is 
<laughs> that is the answer. <laughs> Thank you for that. And we certainly hope it, uh, it is reauthorized. I mean, this really speaks to uh, some of the questions that are being raised in the chat box, especially the pay for question um, that, uh, as you explained, there, there are ongoing debates with the, with the Treasury and the, the, the financing this, these programs. I think that that is something that perhaps our Colombian partners are also running against as Colombia is attempting to uh, meet some fiscal rules. So Diego unfortunately left us, but uh, it, it would be interesting to follow those developments. Mark uh, Ginsburg has a question. Uh, Mark, the floor is yours. Uh, great presentations. <clears throat> it, despite the uh, um, scale of unemployment that was mentioned in both Colombia and particularly in South Africa, I think those are gross underestimates uh, if we were to use the definition of decent employment that Olivier opened the, uh, the session with. Um, but I, I want to get some further discussion um, on this challenge to neoliberalism that is implicit and, well, more than implicit in the model. And what kind of pushback besides from Treasury? What about international finance? Um, uh, and, um, you know, how, how are funds going to be raised, uh, at the national level, except through increased taxation, which might, uh, um, also get some pushback. Again, thank you for the presentation. Adina, do you, do you um, in South Africa? Yeah, um, the reality is that we face a very challenging fiscal environment at the moment. I don't know if any of you have been following South Africa at the moment, but we have a massive energy crisis. Um, we have about eight hours without energy a day, which is absolutely crippling our economy. Um, our argument, of course, is that the energy, the impact of the energy crisis on employment is so dire that it justifies extending the program that was initiated for the COVID crisis. Um, but, you know, there are really very, uh, a wide range of very pressing um, uh, fiscal challenges. Um, in the end, it's about prioritization and it's about the costs of not acting. I mean, part of what we argue is, and it's not just an argument, we see it in day-to-day -day reality is, that if these, if the scale of unemployment continues and in fact is, is exacerbated, um, it will affect social stability. And without social stability, the chances for the kind of economic recovery that would uh, relieve the need for these programs becomes, you know, diminishes. So these are these are actually really difficult. These are really difficult policy questions. I don't mean to 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 diminish. I wouldn't want to be in the minister of finance's shoes. I think what is maybe interesting is that uh, the pushback we get, I wouldn't necessarily describe as a neoliberal pushback in the sense that we, in South Africa, the private sector quite strongly supports these programs. Um, they're under constant pressure to create more employment and they just can't with the energy crisis as it is right now. Um, businesses, I think the figure yesterday was 1,900 small businesses have gone out of business in the last time. You know, we, we, the private sector is being decimated both firstly by COVID and then and now by the energy crisis. And they see the importance of the state coming to the party and supporting employment. So we have tripartite support. Um, and, you know, we're getting support from the in international institutions also um, who see this as a part of the puzzle. So, that's that's not our immediate challenge to be to be to be honest i think the fiscal constraints are the much bigger are the much bigger issue yeah thank, thank you uh kate i see uh, another question i think that the, the cost question is going to be a reoccurring question but isabel has an interesting question of what um uh, have has been the attitude that trade unions have had towards the program you said that they were sympathetic to uh, some parts of the program uh was was this uh, attention as the program was developed um, that got resolved or they were on board from the start? So South Africa has quite a long history with public employment. We have the expanded public works program um, and Labour has been ambivalently supportive of that over the years. 
Um, they have really embraced the employment stimulus. And one of the reasons is that on the whole, um, it has uh, supported paying the national minimum wage and that removed a real tension point. So in fact, for example, every year when the Minister of Finance delivers his budget speech, Labour comes with a set of their demands, as it were, or their expectations from the budget. And in the last two budgets, their top, their first, first on their list has been uh, doubling the presidential employment stimulus. So we've had really good, strong support from Labour. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, I see Rania is with us. Good to see you, Rania. Uh, the floor is yours. You can ask the, your question and unmute. Yeah, Rania, you're you're muted. Let, let me try this. Uh, no, I'm not able to unmute you. Um, perhaps you can hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. Thanks. Um, thanks, Pavlina. This is fantastic. Uh, you're organizing these meetings that are extremely important for all of us. Thank you again. I want to go back a step to the question Mark uh, Ginsburg asked earlier. How is it received <clears throat> as a policy? Um, by other international organizations in the context of neoliberalism and share um, uh, very briefly the experience of Greece where, um, as many of you know, there was a very big program for three years and it continues today actually, despite the change in administration from the left to the right. Um, and what I wanted to, to, to share with the, the participants is that while Greece was under supervision, and that means the IMF was present, but in the case of Greece, because we are in Europe, um, the ECB and the European Commission were present as well, um, they imposed on Greece a cash transfer program they were absolutely opposed to such an intervention as the job guarantee, which we did implement. And um, it was extremely, extremely difficult actually during that period to um, identify the funding. So I think the job guarantee remains a, a threat to the neoliberal const and it is uh, very encouraging and heartening to see that um, in South Africa, Kate, you're continuing this work that you've started many, many years ago. And in Colombia, there is a new initiative. So, yes, we look um, up to those country experiences and to the report that Olivier uh, is preparing. Thanks. Thank Thank you so much, Rania. And um, uh, Olivier asked a question, but perhaps you can ask it uh, 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 on microphone. And I also want to um, just recognize that John Dreze is here and perhaps he can share if we have time, any new developments on the Indian program, because as we know, this is the largest scale job guarantee program in the world that is based on the principles of the right to employment and uh, it is a very significant policy uh, innovation and intervention. So Olivier, um, please. Many thanks, Pavlina. I would be really interested in knowing whether in the South African and uh, Colombian cases, the works provided um, were defined as having to be um, not supplied by private actors and thus not competing with the for-profit private sector, or whether instead uh, a competition was was organized in order to um, uh, to to stimulate private employers uh, uh, to provide better working conditions and perhaps higher wages, um, was there any concern expressed by the private sector that this was a form of unfair competition, since you know? workers subsidized with public funds would be providing perhaps um, at uh, cheaper uh, conditions, services that they might uh, be able to provide themselves. I think that would be one question, but I very much look forward also to, to, to Jean Andres' uh, updating on the, on the INREGA if possible. Thank you.
Kate, any pushback from the private sector in your work? Um, I mean, we, you know, we would like more support. <laughs> um, and and you know, there was a question in the chat also about other funding mechanisms, and 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 yes, that's those are certainly conversations we also want to have. But as I indicated in 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 in, in general. The private sector recognizes that our scale of unemployment is a threat to social stability. They have an interest in social stability. I don't know if you followed the, the, the I don't know what to call them, riots, whatever, last year that absolutely decimated KwaZulu Natal province and, and parts of, of, of Gauteng. Um, so, you know, business has a real interest in a level of, 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 of social stability and unemployment is our unemployment and inequality and poverty are our biggest risks to that. Um, so, so there is a record, you know, there is, um, we are not getting pushback from the private sector. We, we, we would like more support from them. Labor has come out more strongly, um, but uh, that's not our biggest obstacle at the moment, as it were. Thank you, Kate. And, uh, you know, we, we would like to have a, a dedicated panel to the Indian experience um, because it is so significant. But perhaps in the last couple of minutes, uh, Jean can share uh, any notable developments that the year the program has been in, in, uh, implemented for many years, but anything current that should be on our radar. Well, probably uh, this would take a long time. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, but uh, is the crisis moment. Uh, essentially, the current government is not very interested in the Brahma guarantee. And so, we're opening it in various ways through centralization, through uh, technocracy, failure to pay wages on time, and so on and so forth. I think it would be best to talk about that in detail some other time. But if I can quickly share it across source, because I, I thought these presentations were extremely interesting. And obviously, I keep comparing with India. And for me, what was really positive in all this was the quality of the jobs that are being created. Because in India, it's still very much digging. Most of the work is just digging. Uh, it's useful digging. I mean, uh, you know, okay, you can do a lot of things by, by digging. But to see that people can be employed uh, as the assistant teachers and to do environmental work and so on and creative work, that's fantastic. On the other hand, none of this to me sounds like a real guarantee. I mean, these are basically public works programs. And I think there's a big jump from that to a guarantee. And that's where the Indian system is so radical because it's literally a legal guarantee of employment on demand within 15 days. And it leads to tens of millions of people being employed every year. Now, when can I take one more minute or do you have to close? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. So now when you want to go all the way to a job guarantee, first of all, politically, of course, it's extremely difficult. I mean, in, in India, it was a bit of a miracle. But of course, the other question is the costs. Now, interestingly, the Indian experience suggests that the costs are not that huge. I think in South Africa, it might be different because the un unemployment levels are so massive. In India, it never reached more than 1% of GDP, which is a lot of money, but it's, you know, for a, very, for, for a very big purpose. And I used to think that what makes it affordable in India is that the wages are so low. But actually, I'm not sure that's true, because if you look at the minimum wage as a ratio of per capita GDP, it's very similar in India and in European countries. So there's no reason if uh, India can afford it, there's no reason why European countries couldn't afford it. And in fact, it's much cheaper in a way in Europe, because if you don't employ people in public works, you have to pay them an employment allowance. So you just, so the extra cost is just the difference between the minimum wage and the unemployment allowance, which is not necessarily that big. So, uh, so I think it's really worth, I mean, I, I would have liked to hear some, some, something about the cost of these programs in Colombia and South Africa, but I think it's really worth thinking about what it would take to do the big jump to actual guarantee and what it would cost. And of course, also the political challenge. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Jean. I think the, the pay for question is really uh, at the core of, of uh, making permanent, large scale uh, kind of commitment um, to employment security. And, uh, you know, I would like us to explore in other uh, in other sessions, not only that we are preventing current costs of unemployment, but that we can deploy um, public financing means for the funding of these programs. As the COVID crisis demonstrated, public money uh, was mobilized on short order to provide enormous support for the global economy. And we are not even talking anything on a similar scale. So I, I'd like to thank you very much for this wonderful panel. Before I close out, I'd like to announce the next panel um, as part of the Democratizing Work Global series. It will take place on uh, Wednesday again, February 15th. And it is uh, titled Organizing Workers in India. Uh, it is chaired by our colleague uh, Neera Chanhok from Delhi University and Harsh Mander. Uh, the panel will feature two veteran organizers who are organizing women workers, as well as agriculture and plantation workers. So please uh, mark your calendars. Uh, very excited for that as well. And thank you again for your illuminating interventions. I look forward to seeing your future work. Thank you. Thank you.